Jason, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I am ready for the event. Columbia Business School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Columbia's Business School. How do you hear us? I hear you loud and clear, and I'm really delighted to be able to speak with you all today. Tim, we're all in 301 Eurus, and we're all clutching our astronaut ice cream packets, and we're excited to be able to ask you some questions. So the first one comes from Alex Bartanian. Alex. Hi, Tim. Uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, my question is, what's the most important thing you learned during your MBA that you continue to use or apply uh, in your role as a commander on the space station? Thanks. You know, it's a great question, Alex. I think, you know, one of the things that the MBA did for me was just reaffirm that uh, leadership is a continual learning process. We are always learning, and uh, whether it's in a business scenario or here on space station or on the ground and the teams that work there, it's very important for us to continue to build teams, uh, to, to get along with people, and to uh, focus on results. And part of that is us being individually competent in our tasks, whether you know, you're an astronaut and we have very specific skills we need to have. But as a business leader, having those skills so that people respect you, I think, is uh, very vital. Tim, this comes from uh, Binan Zhu. I'm going to ask on her behalf. Was there a business school moment in or outside the classroom which has proved to be a pivotal learning experience for you? You know, I think there was one particular moment. It was a personal leadership class that I had. And this was about a year and a half into our program. And by that point in time, our class became very tight, and we had spent a lot of time together, not just in class, but on the weekends in London and, and in New York, Dubai, and uh, in Buenos Aires. So we were a very tight group. And, and during this personal leadership class, we had a small group session, and it was really a feedback session for us to brainstorm about what our next steps would be. And uh, it was among a very small group of people that uh, we all trusted each other, and uh, we were open to feedback. and. And there's actually been some really tremendous results out of that conversation among those people, not just myself, but some of the other folks in that group. And uh, it was just a, a seminal moment, I think, for, for many of us to have that trusting environment to, to share with other people uh, that were in a similar experience from a business school perspective and, uh, and be able to understand each other better. Okay. Our next question comes from Catherine Canfield. Yes, hi, I'm Kate. My question is, what have you found is the most motivating way to get buy-in from your crew on critical issues that you're facing? Hi, Kate, that's a great question. I think that uh, it's very, very important to, to listen and uh, to be flexible in your thinking. And what happens, I find with myself, and I've seen this with others, is that, that oftentimes when you get in those conversations and if you can keep an open mind, your own opinion and the approach that you take may change. And so it's, it's good to, uh, to try to include the viewpoints of others. And maybe sometimes it's not appropriate to, to incorporate theirs, but making sure that people are included in the process, I think, is, is almost always important. Our next question is from Alex Weinstein. Hey, Tim, thanks for being here for us today. Um, my question is, what new perspectives have you gained from looking at a world without borders? You know, it's a good question. Um, our planet actually has lots of borders. We have uh, oceans. We have mountain ranges that create uh, natural borders. Um, there are borders that are, are there for very specific cultural and historical reasons. But I understand your question. And uh, I guess one thing that you can get a very physical sense of from this viewpoint is that the planet is very interconnected. You see, you see roads at night that uh, connect cities across borders. Uh, you see the contrails of jets leaving major hubs that cross all over the globe, and you see ships going through channels and through waterways. So you can tell that we're a very interconnected planet. And uh, from that perspective, I think that you know it's it's good for us to recognize that that there are lots of differences among peoples and countries, but uh, there are ways that we connect, and it's uh, there's ways to sort that out. And I think business actually is a tremendous way that 
that we are able to have some of that interconnection and, uh, and common bonds. Our next question comes from Robbie Rudkoff. Hey, Tim. Welcome back to CBS Virtually. Um, I, I'm curious to know what you would say are the three biggest differences in the dynamics of managing a team in space as compared to on the ground. That's a great question. You know, I don't think there are fundamental differences, but there are certain things that are amplified that uh, all of us notice. So, for example, our communication with the ground is typically on an open uh, space to ground loop. And uh, what you learn from that is that that uh, there's a lot less context, and a lot, a lot less content in the communication when it's not face to face. We have video conferences with our leadership on occasion, but it's just not the same. And so what ends up happening is that your tone of voice and the words that you use become very, very important. And also conversely, the words that people uh, give you and their tone of voice is very important. So there's a, a much stronger emphasis on that. Um, and a, from a different perspective here, as a crew, there's also um, a change in terms of, of communication because you know we're all together. It's all six of us, and so uh, tone is important. And uh, learning to get along is is a very very vital skill. So that's probably something that's that's more amplified here too. The third thing that comes to mind is that uh, oftentimes you see a a wide variety of leadership styles, maybe uh, not just uh, among different people, but different circumstances. And I would say. With the, the exception of emergency situations here on space station, a directive leadership style is just not appropriate. And so uh, it's interesting watching the process of, of how uh, things work here in space and on the ground. But you know, by and large, it's the same. And those three things to me, though, kind of stand out as, uh, as a difference. All right. Will Campbell is next. Hi, Tim. This next question is inspired by my brother, who's a naval aviator. Um, as you've progressed in your career from Helos to the space station, how have you managed the increased emphasis on team over individual decisions? It's a great question. You know, uh, even your brother, the naval aviator, I'm sure would say that uh, even though he's making individual decisions in that jet or helicopter, it, uh, it really comes down to those decisions impacting the bigger team. And uh, even when I was... Uh, you know, a young aviator and a lieutenant flying Apaches, the decisions I made affected all the people that I flew with. And uh, I, I think that that's still true up here today. You know, we have lots of individual uh, uh, skills and, and uh, individual tasks that we do, but we always have to consider the impact that it has on the broader team. So um, I guess there's always going to be a balance between, you know, your individual decisions and the, the team aspect. But, you know, in my experience, those individual decisions always have come back to sort of uh, an impact on, on the bigger group. Connor Bogan is next. Hi, Tim. I know there's a lot of space between us, but we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with such a star. <laughs> what skills do you think overlap between being an astronaut and being a business leader? It's a great question. I think that uh, that teamwork is is the thing that is the greatest overlap. Uh, human spaceflight is completely a team sport. We have six people up here, but there is an army of people on the ground that support this and really have dedicated their lives and careers to human spaceflight. So we have a very visible role, but they're doing really the, the yeoman's work on the ground to make this kind of mission possible and any future human spaceflight endeavor possible. So teamwork is absolutely vital. And, and anybody who doesn't recognize that, that, uh, that big things take a team, you know, I think doesn't really quite have the right focus. And here on board, we recognize that, that uh, there's no sole person who's making this work, that all of us have to not just uh, get along, but work well together and be more effective as a team. Uh, Tim, I'm going to ask the next question on behalf of Lindsay uh, Delavine. And her question is, in a high-stakes setting such as the International Space Station, is there any room for risk-taking or creativity? And if so, how? It's a great question. You know, we, uh, we use the word risk in a, probably a different way than is used in the, the business community. You know, for us, our whole our whole goal is about risk mitigation because 
What we do is inherently risky. You know, we launch on a rocket to get here. We dock to a space station with lots of mechanisms and operations that have to have to be done nearly perfectly. Uh, we do spacewalks and go outside with hardware that may be imperfect. And uh, and so from that standpoint, you know, we are all about risk mitigation. And uh, from the standpoint of you know risk taking, I understand the the context of uh, risk taking in terms of of trying to come up with new ideas and, and broaden that out. But I think there's probably, you know, what most people would consider less creativity in our job, especially here. The creativity really needs to happen on the ground when you're coming up with a plan. In our case, the best case scenario really is, is to have a well-designed and uh, a well-written plan and then for us to execute it well. And that's not very creative, but that's a, a means by which we're able to mitigate a lot of risk. Okay, uh, Beth DeWitty is next. Hi Tim, thanks again for doing this. We're clearly very excited. My question is, um, as we move forward in our careers, what advice do you have for leading international teams or teams in unique situations? It's a great question. We've had lots of experience uh, with international travel. I had some uh, international groups, uh, international training. You know, we have uh, three cosmonauts on our team here. We have a, a British astronaut here on board. And so uh, we're pretty used to an international environment. You know, from my position, I think it's very important to understand the cultures of the people that you work with. And uh, to the extent that I think it's important to, to take a stab at their language too. And so if you can have at least some basic language skills, even if it's just to show a good effort, I think that's very important. And then from that standpoint, with different groups of people, diverse groups of people and cultures and opinions. I think it's very important to, uh, to listen more and to, uh, to be flexible and to build relationships. I'm going to ask the next two questions on behalf of students who could not be here. This one is from uh, Zhao Wei. Uh, do you have any important advice to current students on how to best leverage the resources and access at Columbia Business School to improve leadership skills? It's a good question. You know, I think uh, from my perspective, leadership is really a hands-on learning process. Um, I mean, clearly there's an academic portion to it. And you know, we can always go to classes and we can read books. You know, the case studies that we had at uh, Columbia Business School and London Business School were very, very useful and uh, insightful. Uh, the class we had in specific leadership skills and, uh, and techniques, I think that's very important. But at the end of the day, once you graduate, it's going to be a hands-on thing. And, and the primary resource, in my opinion, really is your classmates. Because over a period of time, you're going to build strong relationships and you're going to find people that you really trust and that you connect with. And, uh, and those are the kind of people that I think you need to turn to when you have uh, questions and challenges in leadership positions because it's, it's, a, it's a tough business. Being a leader is very, very tough. And doing it by yourself, doing it solo is, is even tougher. So having someone you can lean on and someone you can consult is very important. And, and your fellow students are really gonna be one of those best resources. Uh, the next question on behalf of Amir Tavoli is a handful. Uh, when looking down at the earth, what do you see as our generation's most important challenge? fixing the world we live in today or moving man deeper into space? It's a good question. I don't think it's a, a mutually exclusive problem. I mean, I think we should try to fix the world. I think that we should also continue our efforts to explore. And uh, in some ways, I think that, that perhaps they're related. You know, I've spent some time at some of the, the newer space companies, and I see these young people that are super bright and completely on fire for human spaceflight and for spaceflight in general. And so as a consequence of this, of this vision of, uh, of exploration, I think that they've been energized to perform and to, uh, to do things that they never would have done otherwise. And so that can result in, in uh, economic development and prosperity and those kinds of things I, help, I think help lead to fixing our problems. When there's more resources available to, to solve those problems in terms of of uh, intellectual capital and uh, and money, that uh, that's all a good thing. So, in my mind, they're uh, they're very related. Right. Uh, Sampuna Dasgupta, please. Hi, Tim. Thanks again. 
for doing this. Um, so we all took operations recently, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the biggest process improvement opportunities at the Space Center right now. It's a great question. You know, there, it's interesting having uh, been here before. It was uh, 2009, so it's been a bit of time. And uh, from a process standpoint, you can see that, that Space Station has really become a much more mature process. Um, and it's a big machine, not just the hardware, but the people that are involved in, uh, in all the organizations that make this work. And so I've seen this transition where things have become better and better, uh, but we can still even improve upon that. And there's two areas that, that come to mind that we're still working on and uh, we're making progress on, but we'll continue to, uh, to improve. And that is getting uh, uh, peer-reviewed top-tier science onboard stations sooner so that we can get it here, we can get the results back sooner. I think that's very important. And also I think it's uh, it's vital for us to continue our development of, uh, of life support systems. You know, we have really good life support systems on board, uh, but the process to develop that hardware faster, maybe a quicker turn in terms of getting that hardware up here so we can test it, improve it, and get it back down, uh, that's another area in which we can make headway. Okay, Richard Shaw has a question. Hi, Tim, thanks for so proudly representing CBS at the space station. Um, my question is just hearing your thoughts on the commercialization of space, whether it's through the rise of tourism or the discussion of industrial endeavors such as asteroid mining. It's a great question. You know, there are a lot of companies now that are talking about flying uh, humans in space, people in space. I think, it, I think it's a great idea. The, uh, the challenge there is that human spaceflight has to be almost perfect every time without fail. And, uh, you know, that uh, in some respects stands uh, against the way that businesses tend to work, right? We, uh, we learn, we fail, we improve, we go better. Well, the consequences of failure in uh, human spaceflight are catastrophic, and so it's going to be a challenge. On the other hand, you know, mining resources on near-Earth objects or the moon, I think it's very fascinating to me because then it comes down to the technical feasibility, um, what your business plan is like, and what your return on investment is going to be. So it'll be, uh, it'll be great to see what happens here in the next several years. Okay, Sana Cox, come on up. Hi, Tim. Um, I'd like to know how will the lessons learned from Scott Kelly's year in space be applied to NASA's long-term plans for a voyage to Mars? It's a great question. We spent a lot of time with uh, Scott Kelly and Misha Kornienko up here. Uh, great folks. You know, we don't have a full data set. You know, the science would like to have an N of a lot, and now we have an N of two. Uh, but I think we'll be able to see some trends uh, physiologically on what what occurred, uh, especially since Scott has a twin brother, I think that may help from a scientific standpoint. But equally, if not more important, I think is, is going to be their observations on what it's like to live in space for two years. What are the, the challenges in terms of communications, operations, uh, living environment? Uh, those kinds of things I think will be very valuable lessons that we can take forward. Uh, Tim, unfortunately, we're being told that our window of opportunity is closing. We could probably keep you uh, here all day and all night, or whatever the, uh, the time is, uh, wherever you are around our globe. <laughs> I just want to say on behalf of everyone here and everyone at the school, we really appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure uh, to speak with you all. My experience at Columbia Business School and London Business School was a tremendous highlight, and I'm very grateful for my opportunity to have uh, have studied there. So my best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.